everyone. Okay, today we'll go through some um, ideas from classical to modern period. So the title of this lecture is Formal Languages and Syntax. And if you think about what is the language of architecture, or if you refer to some text, so if you are an author, this would be your language, right? Different languages and each with their grammar, sentence structure, and see. And then if you were a musician, this would be your output or your language. You have to write musical score that's according to certain rules and regulation. Uh, and this idea of language came from uh, Derrida, who's more philosopher. And basically, from the philosophy, we think that this it's a school of thought that thinks that this can also be applied to architecture, right? So like words and phrases and sentences in architecture itself, the notion of form, you also have vocab, words, there was a certain set of rules and grammar, which then lead to the essay, which is your architecture or your building. Um, another idea is, uh, is from Peter Eisenman and this way of study studying history, not chronologically, not narratively, but through canons. And what are canons? Canons are a few buildings every era that causes critical change to the discipline. That's the transformation of new ideas. And these ideas are unique to architectural discipline. So you have to ask, what is ideas that's affecting architecture? It's not social, it's not environmental, it's not economical. These are influences, but there are also ideas that directly affect the outcome of architectural design, right? And we are looking at this as a theory for design, the ideas useful for design and not on paper. So in this lecture, I'm not quite following the timeline because we are not looking at things chronologically but rather tracing ideas that develop over different periods of time in history, right? So uh, we'll start with classical. I think by now, after your exercise, you're quite familiar with certain languages of architecture uh, language. So things like symmetry, um, perfect shape, uh, axis, intersection, where's the center, where's peripheral, and all the platonic shapes, right? So even in sections, you get a kind of pure geometry if you want, primitive geometry. So we trace back a little bit. Uh, the first book that is written on architecture is by Vitruvius. He's a Roman. Um, so, I mean, apparently he is not a scholar, but this is the first surviving book on architecture. Okay, so this is, he wrote this book that survived until now, 10 books on architecture. And there are a few ideas. So note the time, this is one century BC, right? The first, the very first idea he said is Fermitas, Utilitas and Venustas. So Fermitas means stable, can stand up the building. Utilitas means functional. It serves the function of the building. But when it comes to Venustas, which means beauty or aesthetics or attractiveness is a little bit gray. So what is beautiful, right? So for mitas and utilitas, you kind of can gauge what is good and what is bad. But when it comes to venustas, different era, they will have different judgment, right? So in this era, you have, what is the bigger philosophy of the time? So if you know, uh, this guy called Plato, he has theory of forms, right? He said, everyone is originated from a perfect mode, and then we are all shadows, right? So there's this idea of ideal, and it's one, it's singular, correct thing. So it's a very singular worldview of that time. And this platonic solids, this is drawn by Corbusier. Right, it's kind of representing the worldview, and then we call this basic geometry, if you want, the platonic solids, right? So you will see a lot of all this volume in the architecture of that period of time. 
And of course, there's this uh, famous Vitruvian man drawing. So basically, this Vitruvius described what is the perfect proportion of a man, right? It's inscribed in a circle and a square. But it wasn't drawn in his book. It was just this uh, a mixture of Latin and Italian uh, description, right? So if so, uh, the Renaissance architects, you see, they were all trying to decipher Vitruvius' idea of perfect man, right? So they have difficulties basically fitting a perfect human in square or circle. So during that time, circle represents heaven and then square is earth, right? So Georgi, Francesco Georgi tried this and then this, you can see different versions of how they try. And then it took uh, Leonardo da Vinci, the genius, to basically do this, right? And the reason why he can do it is because he offset the center of the square and the circle. Right, which is also, but all the rest, they were trying to align the center of the circle and the square together. Right, so with this, uh, we have the perfect proportion of that time uh, as a as beautiful, right? As a judgment of what is beauty. And then the second oh. idea of that period of time is this strict proportion of Ionic, Doric, and Corinthian order. And these orders are well, if you want, following certain kind of figures, right? So everything is proportionate. Uh, every part of the column is proportionate, right? So there's this saying that if you find a Greek temple, the ruins of the Greek temple, and you, if you just had the dimension of one of these architectural elements, you can basically reconstruct the whole entire temple because everything is proportional from column span, column sizes, and Cornices details. Okay, so this is some drawings showing you proportions of Doric columns and Corinthian columns. And uh, with this order, when the orders they meet at a corner, this is when you have problems of resolution because here they're trying to keep a full bay. And this is called inward col uh, corner, if you want, inboard mm -hmm. corner. So in order to keep this, here you will have a double column, right? So you can see every Renaissance building trying to resolve this corner differently. And then here you have the two columns coinciding with each other and the column disappear, right? So you are left with this little funny thing, right? And then here in Palladio's uh, Villa, you basically have a double column here. So because of the strict order, um, these are the some of the problems where you will have to resolve when it comes to the two faces, elevations meeting one another, right? Albert D solving another one of these with one full column, right? So you can go and study different ways of Renaissance. So basically, last time, whenever a Renaissance building is fully completed, people will run up to the corner and look at how the architect resolved the corner. And then there's also, Vitruvius also said, there's this idea of sighting and genius loci, if you want. So it's the spirit of the place. And you can see it very apparent in the Greek temple. Um, you can see that it's on the hill, now you know. Uh, is sighted, is an object in the landscape, pretty much merged with the landscape. And the way you approach a, a, a Greek temple, these temples are not aligned so much to the entrance. And from the entrance, you basically, you will always see the Greek temple, the corner of the Greek temples, right? And so, in Greek architecture, it's always more 3D, and they are, the architecture is always like an object in a landscape, where this is how you see the Greek temple. In comparison, you here you have a Roman building. Uh, it's always more frontal, elevational. So in front of the uh, Roman building, usually there's a piazza where you kind of 
just able to appreciate the front, right? So this way, instead of a corner, right? So this is another project by Bernini, where there's also a piazza, but here you have a double temple, right? Uh, so here, there's also the idea that uh, the Roman architecture, they are more like voids in a calf in the city. Uh, this is a plan by Noli. Basically, the Poche area, they are all private inaccessible area. And whatever is void, these are public areas, right? So the difference between uh, Greek architecture and Roman is that the Greek um, architecture, they are all objects in the landscape, pretty sparse. But here, the Roman city was already quite built up. So in order to make something that is not chaotic, I think they, it's usually the void, right? So there's an inverse solid and void relationship, that's the, which is the difference between Greek and Roman architecture, right? So you will see like churches like here, lower right-hand corner, right? They are rather perfect in geometry. Uh, this is also related to the invention of perspective by Brunelleschi, right? So basically, Brunelleschi invented a way to mathematically construct perspectives. But as you can see, uh, this is a one-point perspective. So it's used in both Renaissance painting and also architecture representation. And that's because it reflects also the architecture of the time. It's, symmet it's symmetry, right? So you everything is pointing to one point. It's quite stable, if you want, in that sense, right? So here you can see Murasky drawing San Spirito, but this one point perspective is slightly tilted to one side. And that has to do with Murasky's uh, character of trying to invent things. Okay, so this is the Noli map that I talked about earlier. Uh, basically, the solid figure ground, solid void figure ground kind of joins. So if you zoom in here, you can see how this is Vatican, right? St. Peter's is carved out. The rest of the Roman city, they are all farmlands or like pretty dense built up area, right? So there are seven hills in Rome. Basically, these are following the topography, but then you are trying to express power here, the center of the power. So you are using architecture where the intersection of two uh, axes, a kind of formalized axis to express power of the time. Uh, so in 1953, Italian architect Moretti did a series of model, right? And these are the solid of the void. So basically, instead of building the churches, he built the void model. So this is the first time we can actually see space, which is void, which is nothing, as object, right? So there's this inversion of solid and void models, right? So sometimes, uh, as you can see, the the solids of the classical buildings are pretty platonic in terms of form, right? They are quite stable, they are platonic forms. Okay, so this is a way of thinking about architecture that's still used to this day, right? So for example, if we then look at this plan, rather than deciding that the column is of this certain kind of shape, you can imagine this whole thing as a cylinder and you carve out perfect platonic voids, right? So it's an architecture of uh, subtraction, carving, heaviness, right? That is the language of the classical era. And if you look at other Roman cities like Pompeii, you also notice that the houses, they look very chaotic, but there's always this kind of perfect square or rectangular courtyard voids, right? That is the center of the house. But then if you want everything around, it's very messy, right? There's no order, no apparent order. Uh, if you use the tool of crochet, right? The idea of thickened wall. This is Louis Kahn drawing the Scottish uh, tower, 
right? So they you basically have the voids as a figure, and these voids are carved into thick solids and spaces, right? So another one of the drawings of Scottish Tower. So you basically get rather interesting, more interesting than uh, the Renaissance building because those are just extrusion. Here you start to see a little bit of free section, right? And then some other ancient architecture, like if you want, you go back. This is an Ethiopian church that's carved into the ground, right? So this imagining of a solid void, black and white, zero or 100, a very clear cut, of what is solid and what's void. This is distinctive of classical architecture. So some of the modern application of uh, this idea of pushing, right? So you can push anything you want, right? But basically the voice taking the figure, taking, becoming the main figure, and then the solid is like the leftover if you want. But they don't always have to look very heavy. So this is a project where you have this void, uh, but express with a very thin shell, right? But you can still read how the voids and the spaces are figure and not leftover space, not an architecture built with additions, right? And then the same idea in 89, Kuhas use it to design this library, right? So these are, the building doesn't look like that, it's the inverse of this. So if you see here on the left, this is the building. These are the right, these are the different voids that he cuts to the building itself. Right? So this strategy, so you can see the evolution of idea that is developed 2000 years ago and is still being pushed. So these are his plans. Basically, these are the special spaces of the library. The black parts, they just hold books, traditional, you know, library archive books. Right. And then another project by Rem Kohlhaas that's also using this kind of Poche strategy. So he has this volume here and voids are also cut out where the voids connect one side of the building to the opposite side, right? So you basically carve out voids and you have special space as void and the rest are just stacked regular homogeneous spaces, okay? Um, okay, so this is a way of representing uh, in classical period because there was no cameras yet. So basically whatever they draw is very realistic. The way art is, is what you see and what you draw, right? Light and shadow, there's no abstraction. The more realistic you can draw, the better. Right, so another, this is a sculpture by Michelangelo. And if you zoom in, this is the level of detail, right? So this whole thing is carved out of marble, but you can actually see the veins, right? So if you want to go realistic, this is the way to go, right? This carve out of marble, it's not a clay or something soft, okay? And that's why the building of this era uh, is always rendered with very realistic light and shadow. And you can also just draw half elevation and half section because the building is basically symmetrical, right? So you have another, uh, some color here. You can see all the rendered light and shadow. And so we talk a lot about the void of the building as a figure, right? So now if we go back to focus on the solid part, uh, these temples are basically made of stacked marble, right? You know, you should know now. And this is before the marble. Basically, everyone is just building primitive huts, right? They just take a few twigs and they tie together, right? But then in classical time, everything is compressive, which means you stack blocks of stone bricks or some sort of things, right? So you can also study and because in Athens around there, you get a lot of marble. So it's natural that they use marble and they stack, right? So if you study a little bit more, uh, you can see how the marble quarry is still present in 
uh, today, right? So this is the same quarry from the same mountain that's used, right? And then you can think a little bit more how different parts of the building, they are carved out from different part of the mountain in different ways, right? Because these are natural materials, so there's layering and how these are, uh, uh, how the stone performs and you will need different performance, right? For different parts of the building. Then you think, right? This is 500 years before BC and how they transport. So they will have special tools, special hoisting material. So these are all the things that you can study. And of course, the marble blocks, they have to be connected by steel member and how these are being done. And of course, the columns, right? There's a connection here. So this is your classmate here, here trying to make, trying to study the wood connection between the marble column blocks, right? Uh, and so it's, everything is good for a while until something is happening, right? So when you go to Bunaleski's um, church here, you start to see uh, the innovation, right? Because this is arch and this is a perfect dome. And the way this dome is connected is based on uh, ribs, the idea of ribs, right? Which means originally everything is stacked, right? So if you push one of these blocks, the whole thing is going to collapse. This is pure uh, compressive. And then we are shifting into something new, right? Everything is changing, right? So you have all these brick ribs taking the load and the infill can be free. Right, so if you study some of these uh, brickworks and hoisting machine for Brunelleschi's dome, you will see how this dome is constructed without supporting scaffold. They basically interlock each other to prevent sliding down. Right, so this is the another your classmates' work. We try to figure out the brickwork of the dome. Right, so this is the section showing different layers of brick. So we are now nearing 1700, like 200 years after the start of Renaissance. And something is changing. So this is an etching by Piranesi. Mm -hmm. um, he kind of discovered the ruins of the Roman, which is around BC time. And what you notice is this very stable representative kind of mode, we are changing now into something a little bit crazier. There's multi perspectives, not one perspective anymore. You have multi faceted perspectives, right? So he discovered the ruins of Romans and then he documented in uh, Campo Matsu, right? So Noli plan just now is drawing something very realistic of Rome, of like checking the public spaces and the solid spaces, but uh, Piranesi's Campo Mazzu is totally fictional. So he finds fragments of ancient Rome and then he kind of collage it in this map. This is not a realistic map, right? So you can see that the world is kind of changing because in this time you also have the people like Copernicus, uh, Galileo, Kepler, right? Suddenly, uh, Earth is not the center of the universe. You have science, right? People understanding a little bit more about the universe. And therefore, Baroque period, like Boromini and all this, they no longer have the pure perfect circle, the perfect square, perfect platonic shapes, right? You start to want to destabilize something that is so absolute, so stable, so black and white. Right, so here we start to have two circles, so which is the center, right? You start to have ellipse, two triangle, two of everything, concave, convex, right? So where is the center, right? But so because the world is starting to change, the worldview is starting to change. In 70, 1789, you have the French Revolution, the birth of social sciences like sociology, politics, and economics, right? And so the, the world is changing, you start to have society, you start to have government, right? And last time you're just building huts or uh, villas and then churches. 
it's pretty simple. But now all of a sudden you start to have library, you have to build prison, you have to build government buildings, you have to build schools, you have to build hospital, right? So basically the whole classical language is hitting a kind of limit, right? So it's easy, like if you just do church, but then when you have school or hospital of a certain size, how can this classical language of Doric, Corinthian, uh, Ionic columns, right, be applied to this whole era? I'll show you a little bit more later. And so this utopia, this idea of utopia and singularity is starting to disintegrate. Okay, so we take a big quick jump into modernism. Uh, okay, so Colin Rowe, basically in the 90s, right, trying to compare Villa Foscari and Villa Stein. He's basically saying that these two buildings are the same and we can compare across time, right? One building from the 1500s to another building that's built in the 1900s, right? So obviously they look different. What is this guy talking about? So basically he's talking about, if you look at the plan, there's a kind of uh, organization between these two buildings that's quite similar, right? So this is the, what we call A, B, A, B, A grid, right? And you can see this invisible grid basically organizing these two buildings, right? Of course, in the classical era, it's symmetrical. A, B, A, B, A, but you enter from here and then if you have a staircase here, you need to have a staircase over here, right? But then look at what uh, Kubuzier did in the 1927. So he said, okay, I'll put entrance to one side of the building and then you'll expect the exit on the opposite side. So all of a sudden, you're trying to create something asymmetrical and dynamic, diagonal. Right, because you don't want to do the grids the same, but you don't want to do what's been done before. Okay, so we'll go through this analysis um, of Villa Stein for exercise two and find out how we can compare this. And then uh, Colin Rowe also said, okay, you can also similarly compare Villa Lotonda to Villa Savo, and this would be the four square grid. Right, so if you look at um, Villa Rotonda, it's arguing that this is a four square grid because this is a corridor space, right? And the same for Villa Sava, right? So you have a column in the middle and therefore you have to enter to one side. And when you enter to one side, the building becomes unbalanced. So what do you put on the opposite side, right? So these are some of the languages. So basically the idea of four square and nine square grid, right? Nine square grid means there's a kind of space and void in the center. And four square grid, you will usually find some structure in the middle, right? And because of that structure, you have to enter to the side and that sets up the whole asymmetry and dynamism, right? So you will not design something that's symmetrical. Right, so this idea, using this idea to understand a lot of building organization uh, is the key or what is created in uh, the modern era, right? So Colin Rowe went on and kind of studied all the villas of uh, uh, Palladio and you can see how they are mostly ABABA. So this is a diagram, this is scalars. Uh, the proportion you can set. Different buildings, they have different proportion, but he's also using the smaller grid to organize some of the services and you'll see the spaces occupying the bigger space, right? So what is this diagram for? Basically, these are all the projects that's generated by the nice square grid. So it's nice square, but it doesn't look like it's square nice square, right? But you can see how here in this project, the nice square, so every intersection will have a column. And here, the same, but the partition is random or it's curved, right? So these are all the columns that's generated by the nice square and even this one that looks somehow random, right? So the nice square is organizing 
the columns, but the columns not found at every intersection. And then there's a kind of rotation of the triangle. It's a displacement from the grid, right? So you will say, then the grammar is that, okay, every triangle I have to rotate 30 degree and it will be displaced from the intersection by two meter, three meters. Okay, so basically it's just an organization idea, but it doesn't mean that your building will look like a box, right? So if you look at, go back to history, so basically all the Western churches, they are all nine square because you basically have to enter to the center and you walk down the aisle, right? The nave. But then if you compare it to something Asian or uh, whether it's Japanese or Chinese, you'll find that the ancient buildings are mostly four square. And this one has to do with a little bit of the structure, which is timber. So it's not stone construction. You can study more of this later. I'll cover in the next lecture a little bit more, but just remember this PC shrine. Okay. So in the modern era, you have to know Domino House by Corbusier. What is this diagram? So this is also a diagram. It's not a building, right? We go from uh, Parthenon to uh, Roman a, a dome and then Brunelleschi's dome. And then we are here now, right? So this is diagram. The material is reinforced concrete, right? It's just columns, which is frame structure. You are no longer stacking bricks by brick, right? You are moving into a kind of pose and beam structure and the spaces are stacked. And this is open, this is lightweight, right? So what happened? So this is a book by Corbusier. In 1760, to 1840, you have first industrial revolution, right? Where the society basically transit from agriculture to industrial, and then there's mass production. So mass production is quite an important word because it means the reproduction of the same modules, right? Repeated modules. And cast iron, steam power, cement, these are all uh, invented, right? So Corbusier is joined also the second industrial revolution, like the invention of, crews, planes, and automobile, right? And then he's comparing this to Patinon, right? And this drawing is by Kubu. So he's looking at Boom and he's like, what are we doing? We are, why are we still doing this, right? Something, we have to invent new language because we now have new materials. We are in a different world from before, right? So why are we still doing all these platonic forms, right? So this is him traveling to Rome and analyzing and saying this, right? So this is Kobu. Now you should recognize this, right? The size of the, the base of the column and then the connection here of the column. So Kobu is basically saying these five points, right? What do they mean? If we go and study this, right? It's like, okay, this is a plan. Familiar? This is a classical building, right? something very heavy because these are all heavy stone or masonry blocks wall, right? Then he's saying, Pilates, let's build holes and beams, right? So these are the columns. This is a grid, a grid of columns, right? And then we no longer need to have load bearing walls. So these are walls that's load bearing, but now we are using concrete columns to hold up the floor. And then our infill walls can be free. So why are we, so he's not following the column grid, you can see, right? So all these walls, you would just go curve and go around the columns, right? So what it means is that I have a grid of columns that is very efficient, that can be mass produced as structure, but it doesn't mean that the spatial experience of this building is greeted, right? Because you are using the infill walls, non-load bearing walls to shape the spatial experience, right? So there's this detachment of uh, spatial element and structural element in the modern time, and we call this uh, free plan, okay? 
So if we jump over here, this is what he's drawing for the free facade. Yeah, these two are kind of related. So last time, because you can't take too many bricks out from a load bearing brick wall, so the windows are very small and elongated vertically. But now he can have end-to-end -end windows opening, right? Because the facade, they are just like a plane that's hanging on the structure itself. It's no longer taking load, okay? So these days we have glass cladding and all this, okay? And then there's roof garden, of course. So he's saying, you see the ancient building is sitting on the ground, but we have Pilates, we can raise the first floor, right? So this ground can be free for cars, for you, for landscape, for you to go through. And then if you want a private garden, you can go to the rooftop, right? So it doesn't cut. Because by this time, the society is going urban, right, industrial, and you will have density, right? So it doesn't take up green spaces, and then you don't, it doesn't cut the urban experience in Bhutan, right? So this is what you get now, HDB, right? So Singapore, 70% of Singapore is like that, right, from here. And then if you look at this Carpenter Center by Corbusier, so you have the Pilates, so you notice that this direction, this is a four square grid, you have a column in the middle. But if you look at this direction, this is a nine square grid, right? So because you have a column in the middle here, you have to enter from the side, and then you start to create this kind of asymmetry, right? You also notice that the column grid is not square or less squarish, right? Which means this idea of the grid is really quite flexible. It's just a diagram, right? It doesn't determine the absolute length and width, right? And you can grow as big as your building requires. So basically, his Cartesian grid grid a whole entire world. And the facade here is just the limit. It cuts off the limit of your... Uh, it sets a limit, the boundary of your grid, basically. Right? But you must imagine that all his buildings, the grid is everywhere. Okay, So here you have other non-load bearing elements and usually they are offset from the grid to express that these two elements are distinct. They are not the same uh, system. Right, So you have ramps or you have walls and you will curve them. So again, to break the box. Right? So this is how the building looks like. If you want. So, so we are we don't have this perfect geometry as a guide anymore. So last time, classical time, if you have a perfect circle or perfect square, everybody clap, right? This is a good building. But now we don't have it anymore. Right? So it's gone to something called modular man, right? It's still kind of proportion. But this is small, like small units. Right, so the relation of this to the bigger units, this is golden ratio. But your final building is made up of small little units and then you get the result rather than, so it's a kind of inside out kind of uh, organization rather than establishing a certain kind of outline and then you subdivide the perfect geometry. Right? So he drew this and you can study the proportion. So he uses this to organize all his building. Right? So this idea, if you look back in history, is not exactly that new. Right? So you will see here, this is something from Parthenon where you start to use uh, the hand, the arm and the, uh, uh, the elbow right? as a measure, as a unit of measurement. Okay, and then if you look at closely at the bottom part of uh, uh, Da Vinci's drawing, these are proportions, right? And he would also, see, can you see the hand? is divided into different proportions, right? So we are focusing too much on the circle and the square, but actually the idea of modules and smaller units is already there since classical time, right? So you will have, if you look back and then if you look at Alberti's thesis in uh, 1400s, right? So he's against actually rigid proportion, like it has to be this by this proportion, right? So there's a free play of 
A, B, C, D, A, right? So everything is proportional, but you know, it's kind of uh, like algorithm, right? It's less like, oh, it must be six meter by three meter kind of, right? And therefore there's this idea of continuitas, which means, so you have all these little parts, right? So beauty to him is the harmony of parts to whole and then a whole to part. Right, so he has this famous saying of how the city is like a large house, and the house is like a small city. Right, so you are always you're not just thinking about parts in the building, but also the relationship of the building to the city itself. Right, so this is something new because you can only think of this when you have a city. Before, if it's just all agricultural, this is not useful. Right, so we look at Palladio for that reason. So we talk a little bit about how all his villas following the ABABA algorithm, if you want, right? So this is his sketches, you can see, right? So this algorithm thinking will be very important in our next exercise, right? And then if you look at Brunelleschi's churches, they are also not based on platonic form, right? Brunelleschi started using repeated modules, right? Repeated uh, cubes and modules to make his churches. So it's a little bit different from the other churches that you study, right? So remember when uh, there's French Revolution and then you start to have other types of um, buildings, so-called, right? So Durand studied, you know, the he went to document all the languages, all the possibilities of uh, portraits, right? How many columns, three, three bay, four bay, five bay, Right, of all the existing buildings that's been built up to the 1800s, right? So he's building something like a library or a catalog, right? That you can then use, mix and match to make a bigger building, right? So this is neoclassicism, if you want, like a lot of the French buildings, Louvre, right? So like a uh, single column is not enough anymore because of the proportion then they will double up the columns, right? So this is where the classical language is kind of hitting its limit. And that's why you have the modern language, right? That's why Corbusier proposed all this. So you can take a look if you're interested. This is the Boza school, right? And then you can look at Schinkel's of this museum. So this is one of the best example of neoclassical uh, architecture. It's a library, which again is a new uh, type for that era. Okay, so this is uh, Corbusier's modulo. So go study, right, how these proportions, they are obeying the golden ratio. So it's no longer like, you know, it has to be this shape, square, circle, but it's all modular, right? So you have to find the modules in your building for modernists, right? Then not only, so the body, something from the body is taken to, for the measurement of all the cabinetry seats, right? Because your relationship of your body in space, right? So the measurement is from your body parts and then kind of sets the heights of furniture, windows, doors, everything in your house, okay? And that's why Katsura uh, Imperial Palace, right? These are following the module of the tatami mat. Right, so you cannot draw Katsura without understanding the size of tatami mat. Right, so again, this kind of model, modular repeated modules, they basically dictate and set out and organize the whole thing. And what you notice is also, uh, this is 1600 period, uh, building in the East, compared to, this is a time of Borromini, right? Uh, classical, very symmetrical, but in the east, you have a different trajectory, right? They, they don't look at axis and symmetry, right? So how do you determine this organic growth? This one looks like a building that is built now, right? Of course, not the look of it, the thatch or the wood, right? But it's the, uh, the idea of organization. Okay, so this period, uh, we have the invention of two-point perspectives, like Corbusier likes to draw because uh, this is a view from the car, right? So it's no longer stagnant one point perspective. 
So in general, you will have a lot of two-point perspective. And if you look at the artwork, right? So we had some Michelangelo's very realistic depiction of reality, right? So now camera is already invented, right? So Picasso can draw very well. He can shade light and shadow, but he's like, what's the meaning of doing this now that we have cameras and all this, right? So he's trying to find new ways to depict 3D. And he came up with this idea of layering of a, 2D things, right? To describe a 3D object. And this is what you call cubism, right? So this is a way, a new way of seeing. And then you can see Corbusier uh, subscribed to uh, this idea. And he's he painted these things. Of course, his paintings are a lot more geometrical than Corbusier, uh, than Picasso, right? And then this period you also have Mondrian, right? So abstraction. It's no longer about the the, pitch, uh, the optical reality. What you see is what you get. It's a lot about abstraction, right? So an abstraction and depiction of reality through geometry, right? So this is Mondrian's drawing in the certain proportion that you can study as well between all these grids, right? And the bright colors. So if you see this painting in real life, it's uh, actually 3D. After a while, you'll see all these colors and lines um, shifting up and down because close up, you can see like the black is drawn over the red, right? So this is quite amazing. So it looks very flat, but it's actually 3D, right? So there's a lot of this uh, theoretical argument or pursuit regarding 2D and 3D. So this is another Monjon drawing. And if you look long enough, the real painting, you see all this thing moving, like a night view of a city, right? And then, of course, then everyone is challenging the idea, right? So in terms of sculpture, you have, remember David, right? So I said, uh, Duchamp say, so if anything you put on a pedestal, you will call it a sculpture. So I'm going to put something that is a mass produced in the current day. And then this is, can this be sculpture? So why must sculpture always be something, uh, an object that you walk around or an object that you look at, right? So they are thinking about all this fundamental uh, definition of art, right? And because of that, then you get things like Robert Smithson's uh, spiral jetty. You say, what if I did a sculpture that is bigger, so big that it cannot fit in a gallery, right? So he did this jet, uh, jetty and this one will change according to the tides and sunlight, right? And then another guy, Sarah, said, why must sculpture be something that you walk around and look at? This is basically something that you can walk into. Then at this point, then you ask, what is the difference between sculpture and architecture, right? So they are no longer an object that you look at. They are all spatial. You can go inside. So what is it, right? So you will see huge Sarah's sculpture like this, right? Or in terms of painting, then they are saying, why are you always putting paint on a canvas, right? So putting something on the ground, the ground in this case is the, 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 the canvas, right? And then say, okay, I'm not going to put paint on the canvas. I'm just going to take a pen knife and then cut the canvas, right? So um, another idea where it's like, okay, I'm not going to make a sculpture that sits on the ground. I'm going to carve into the ground. So we have negative void sculpture by Mike Geiser, right? Or you have Calder saying that, why must sculpture be static, right? Can we have something dynamic? So all this thing moves, right? And they balance, right? So it's no longer something so stable or representing reality, right? So you have something that moves and these are amazing, right? Or you can have water timaria. Uh, planting a lot of lightning rods in the field, right? So you go there and you see lightning, right? So this is a uh, lightning field. So you can see how art, art is always in front of architecture, right? They are going uh, uh, to something very abstract. And then you have Cardency talking about points lines plane, right? And points lines planes, or Theo van der Spurk, Right, so you have point, which is in architecture, column, lines, and then the planes, right? So you have some of the modernist architecture looking like that. Okay, so here, 
Can you see? So this are uh, Miss Van der Rohe's brick house, right? Then you ask, where is the nine square and the four square grid? Right? So architecture has become, where's the grid? There's no more boxes, no more A, B, A, B, A. Then how do we de decide how much to offset? How this, how, to, how do you decide how long and how far away this brick walls are, right? How do you set up something like that? What is the organizing principle, right? So he's very influenced by this. And then you get Barcelona Pavilion, which you're going to study, right? And Hub House, right? So this is Hub House. Uh, so this is what you're going to find out in this exercise too. How do you decide? Can I still find ABABA in this? Can I still find nine square grid or four square grid? Where's the center? Where's the peripheral? Do I still use the vocab of axis, intersection, and symmetry? Or they are all not valid, or we are inventing all new vocabulary, right? And then Miss would be using a lot of steel and glass, right? Again, another modern material. So here, kobu, concrete, Miss, steel, and then you have uh, wood, timber, Right, so but they are all frame structure like Brunelleschi stone. They are no longer solid load bearing. Uh, okay, so some of these ideas, then your the boxes, they start to be shattered. Right, there's no more clear defined boundary. So if you study uh, Miss Building, his roof is always not aligned with the floor. Right, so you get this kind of in-between spaces, which later is picked up by a uh, modern architect like Sana in this project. Uh, yeah, in order to understand this, you basically have to understand these first. Okay, so uh, maybe last point. So a bit on the exo joints. So this is how we draw usually classical exo building, right? Because looking up, uh, because that's the space you look up instead of looking down and it's half as usual. So Kabu likes to draw and so on because uh, planes are invented, right? So you have this aerial perspectives. So he drew a lot of his large scale urban planning from the planes, right? So you see this new um, found perspective. Last time you are, you are always stuck to the ground and you are looking up, right? But now all of a sudden you can see and you can, from above, you can master plan, right? And then eventually you'll get to this uh, project where this is a 90 degree azonometric, right? So this era, they are thinking about 2D and 3D, right? So John Edel is like saying, well, can we then, can architecture ever be 2D, right? So, uh, he said, okay, so if you project a square plan and you made it exon, you'll get a cube, like a diamond, right? But if you have a diamond plan, you project, you'll get this kind of like 90 degree isometric, right? So in this drawing, it seems like uh, architecture has no space. Architecture is 2D. Right, so this is just a theoretical kind of project. Okay, so you see a few of his projects. There's then uh, trying to do this kind of uh, 2D and 3D kind of project, right? So eventually end with this wall house. So from one perspective and against this wall, it looks like it's a flat building, but actually the building is very long and there's this depth and passage. So how do you cross the threshold between 2D and 3D? So this is something that's thinking about. Okay, so, okay, last point. Remember the roof garden. So in order to get to the roof garden in Villa Savoie, the first time the ramp is inserted, right, into the building. So last time in classical period, it's just one story, right? Everything is extruded, but now you have different stories, right? So you, when you get from level to level, there's always this problem of 
horizontal circulation and how you move up. They're all segregated, right? So Kobu inserted this uh, ramp inside so that you can just slowly walk up to the rooftop like a promenade, right? So this is an idea where all of a sudden you can slowly move through vertically. Okay, so because now you have multi-story building, but last time, no, if you look at Palladio's villa, when they have two story, it's always a staircase, right? So quite abrupt. It's like you enter a staircase and you go to the stairs. So here, as you walk up, you can enjoy the scenery or whatever, right? So this idea is, if you want, is eventually used by Ram Puas again for his library, right? So the floors are all connected all the way up, right? So this building is also not built, but fantastic and then as a result uh, he drew this section so this is not a realistic section this is a conceptual section to show the journey from the ground to the place called unroll section okay so it's not like a normal section that you draw okay so this building the reduced version is eventually built in here uh, i can take a look right or the idea of this horizontal landscape uh, it's also picked up in Agadil, right, in the desert. Right, how can we, because you can't escape horizontal and vertical in buildings, right? So I'll show you very quickly because you, in order to understand this, you really have to understand Corbusier and these first. Okay, then eventually, again, it got picked up by uh, Sana, right, where this building, there's no flat ground, right, it's all topography. So how do we how do we get here, and why? Uh, yeah, I think we will stop here because. Uh, yeah, that's all. Thanks, Sai. Can you hear me? I'm, I'm Brian. Yeah, I can hear. Hi, Brian. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, thank you. I think it's a very informative lecture. I think it really makes sense of what we've been trying to do in the last two weeks. And hopefully this very useful talk can make that connection between week two and week three, right? Uh, I'm going to see if any of the students have any questions. Or maybe give yeah. a couple of them to think because I think you plow through quite a bit. I, I'm sure they lost you at slide 125 or something. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, when you go to the yeah. sauna part, I thought like everyone's lost already. I think so too. That's why I'm like, okay, stop now. Yeah. So I, I'm just going to keep it open for a couple of minutes. Does anyone have any questions that they want to just kind of type up, unlock the mute button and ask? Because I think a lot of words I covered today, uh, hopefully pre preoccupations and the concepts that you've already been looking at in fair detail in the last two weeks and then transitioning into the last weekend of some of these modern buildings that you've been studying in as well. Any questions, Don't make me ask, huh? I think it's also very comprehensive that it's done it in a very chronological way. I think we can all kind of follow the concepts and make sure it makes it quite clear. Like. Okay, I don't know about my studio, but is anyone else in any one other studio happy in the Zoom chat? Oh, okay, I'm going to release Sai from her misery. Uh, and this is recorded anyway. So I would expect everybody to kind of read this, this and really try to digest it, especially you know, exercise too. I think you have a better understanding of what's going on as well. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks, Sai. Okay. Yeah. All right, see you.